So I'd say there was quite a lot of material in uh, both your 10 minutes presentation and they're both about quite fundamental questions. So I just opened the, the floor to questions or comments. Uh, you can uh, raise your virtual hand or unmute yourself if you prefer. Uh, Mark Florbe, please. Yeah, okay, thank you. Hello, everyone, and uh, thanks for organizing this, uh, this, this workshop on a very important topic indeed. So I just wanted to, um, to say that while I was uh, listening to the talks, I was thinking about um, one issue perhaps that we should uh, keep in mind, which is that um, it's not just that people may differ in terms of um, uh, focusing illusions or things like that. They, they may have a different um, normative a view of what, what's good in life and, and what uh, well-being consists in. And, um, and so I was thinking of that in particular when listening to, so Mark, when he was taking, talking about uh, examples, he, sometimes he was talking about the underlying phenomenon as being feelings and sometimes about something much more objective like a house or something like that for that particular price. And so, so you can have people in, in society where for some people what's important in life is feelings and for other people it's uh, it's wealth and this sort of thing and this is this is not just a matter of taste it's also a, a normative issue right so so it has to do with what they believe is morally important and this kind of uh, moral disagreement between people may reflect on on heterogeneity in their responses to this sort of thing so so i wanted to mention that because in 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 the in theory of well-being we always have all these uh, various normative theories. And I think this uh, diversity and these disagreements uh, uh, about normative theories of well-being probably can also uh, infect uh, people's responses because they may um, be influenced by some of these, uh, po uh, some popular versions of these theories. So thank you very much, uh, Mark Florbe. I see uh, Chris Berntolade has his hand up. Uh, yeah, thanks for both of those introductory talks. I just wanted to um, throw out a couple of uh, distinctions that it might be useful to keep in mind when we talk about all these various problems. And one is things that are going to contribute to noise, uh, but not bias. So um, just to give, I've forgotten some examples, but for instance, if there's, uh, if we're talking about whether people end up at the top or the bottom of a particular number in the response scale, um, that's go not going to be a problem, I would imagine, when you have several or many people. Um, uh, you know, so, and similarly, there, there are some of these other effects which, uh, which I think are less of less concern because they. Um, are likely not to matter with with large samples, uh, or then they're uh, well. Fundamentally, they're not going to give us biases. They're going to make things harder to measure. Um, one thing, just as an advertisement for my talk, um, I don't think either of you covered the possibility of non-monotonicity. Uh, so we often talk about non-cardinality, but I will show you that people don't always respond higher on the scale when they're better off. Uh, so they can actually go down. Um, so that's another more complicated problem in, in mapping. And then just in general, I'm a little overwhelmed by all of this about how much structure um, you're able to put on the, on the processes that people are going through in, in um, responding to these questions. And, and I wonder if we could also think about which kind of theories about measurement problems are falsifiable. Uh, and where we're really putting on too much structure and we start to talk about angels dancing on heads of pin as opposed to being grounded in things that we are ultimately going to be able to, ha having a simple, simple enough theory and approach and uh, understanding of how people respond that we're actually going to be able to stay empirical with it. Um, and then one other distinction maybe um, even is, is, of course, there are things that are affecting people's experience that are different from that are not necessarily measurement problems and they're philosophical uh, choices, I suppose, that come in here. But if somebody is uh, feeling less bad because, uh, less good because of a comparison effect or be, or feels, has different normative 
uh, stances or different values, you know, we might say that's not a measurement problem. That is part of what we are trying to get at. Uh, uh, okay, thank you. Thank you very much. By all means, Casper and Mark, of course, feel free to uh, to reply or not. I think it's a good idea to have some initial thoughts just from everybody coming in. Yeah, I agree. Claudia, please. Uh, yes, this is just to uh, elaborate on on what Marc Florbet said. Uh, I think it's important to distinguish two steps in the transformation of latent utility or latent uh, whatever uh, feelings or uh, happiness or uh, so. There's one. The first step is uh, I feel something and uh, and I'm going to um, uh, I uh, I don't know I earn a certain amount of money and this is going to uh, make me feel more or less uh, happy or satisfied. And the second step is uh, I feel satisfied and I'm going to report this on a scale. So the heterogeneity uh, about which Mar Mark was talking, I think is the first step. So people have different tastes, different preference, but this is also true for anything, for any consumption good, there is heterogeneity. Some people like chocolate, other like uh, Rice Krispies. And, uh, and it's not a problem. I mean, still people economists estimate uh, uh, demand functions and preferences. And this is interesting, actually. It's a, it's a field of interest for well-being to study heterogeneity. For what group of the population is uh, the conception of happiness more moral, as you say? And for what group, uh, what, what are the groups which are more materialistic? So the, but this is, I think it's not really a methodological problem. It's interesting and, uh, and worth, uh, worthy of, uh, of study. The second step is more difficult. And I think uh, the workshop is more about the second step, which may be uh, difficult to overcome. Please, Tyler, see the hand up. Will, Harvard University. Thank you um, for a very stimulating presentations. I um, have a remark, an alternative perspective, I think, related to some of the past ones. But um, a lot of the discussion has assumed that there is some sort of underlying mental state that, that we're trying to study that, that does, in some sense, e exist. But I mean, an alternative view of what's taking place and what we're analyzing and what we're trying to improve is just people's responses to the question itself um, under circumstances that are, to the extent possible, absent from um, undue uh, social desirability bias or reporter influence. I mean, essentially, what we would like as policymakers is if people are posed, how satisfied are you with life as a whole these days? That again, absent any undue influences, they, they generally respond positively. It's not the only thing we're, we're after. We, we also want to look at objective aspects of well-being. It's just, it's just one of, of many. And you know, I think from that perspective, if all we're trying to do is, to the extent possible, improve these psychological responses, you know, a, a lot of these problems do go away. I think some of the issue is conflation or, or a desire to conflate the, you know, the off-the-cuff responses to these questions with some measure of ultimate utility. Um, and I, I think it's, it's very much an economist's uh, perspective, the, the belief that, that such a thing exists. But I think a lot of the problems that have been raised and discussed suggest that that, that might not, in, in fact, exist. There is no underlying latent utility that, that we are capable of, of capturing. And so this is just one of many goods <laughs> that we're, that we're you know, trying to assess and, and improve. And I think that was related to some of Mark's earlier comments as well. People care about different things. Yes, they care about life satisfaction, but many are willing to trade off some life satisfaction for, for trying to do the right thing or for the sake of the relationship, even if it makes them uh, less subjectively happy so that it's worthwhile capturing many of these objective states, but also supplementing them with the objective goods uh, as, as, as well. So, so again, I think if we deflate what we're trying to do, this is not some measure of ultimate utility. It's just one of many things that's worth studying. And um, some of these problems, at least to, to my mind, uh, dissolve. Thank you very much, Talamander Wheeler. Michael, Michael Blant, please. Yes, yeah, so I, I want to reflate the problem 
Um, I mean, the reason I'm interested in these things is because I think those underlying mental states are the things which matter intrinsically. Um, you know, I'm interested in measuring happiness because I think happiness is, is the thing which ultimately matters. You know, if you don't think it's the only thing, you probably think it's one of the things we contribute to that other thing. So I think I think that that level of deflation means is kind of concedes that look, if if we really believe that, then we should just give up on this whole enterprise because the things we say we're measuring, we're not really measuring. Um, and of course, to kind of take that further, if you just wanted people to uh, give, you know give higher responses, you could just pay them to, to score 10 out of 10 every time, then you would have achieved the policymaker's goal of just getting people to give you higher responses. I think we're interested in higher responses because we think the underlying stuff is, is of intrinsic value, um, at least you know, instrumental value. Um, and uh, so uh, relating to that, taking it back to, to Mark's point, uh, or something Mark was saying, I think it does make a difference uh, what your your underlying philosophical views are. So um, on Mark's point about, you know, the person gets the million pound house, but then they change their point of view and they feel worse. Well, um, if you, you know, at, at this stage, one needs to make a decision about, do you care about people's feelings? In which case it is important to record that their feelings have gone down for whatever reason or another. And so the, the sort of the scale shifting has caused no, so sort of this reflecting on the life has caused them to feel different, but ultimately what's of interest is that they feel different. Uh, or if you're taking some more kind of objective um, conception of well-being, then yes, the person is really making a mistake. Uh, you know, the, the better angels of their well-being would say that their life has gone worse. So, so whether there's a problem does depend upon where you come down on these, uh, on these moral questions. Thank you, Michael. Chris, please. Hi. Um, lower that down. Um, yeah, I mean, I think uh, Mark and, and, and now Michael sort of pointed out to the two issues. I mean, whether the two approaches, whether we are focusing on mental states as they are. Um, because we value them, um, and, per and perhaps people might, some people might value them as what uh, it's really what um, well-being or not. And I, and I think it's um, it's a helpful distinction, and it's important that we need to take a decision. But I guess the the issue with the whole discipline is that we uh, many people are reluctant to take a decision like from like uh, first, you know, without uh, doing, I mean, letting enough time for the research to tell us, you know, where it's going, I guess, you know. So there's a, there's a, a desire for have, uh, there, there might be a desire for uh, using philosophy to fix, you know, what is the, what is the attribute that we are trying to measure at and why we care about that attribute. But I guess there's also like a, a more um, coherent perspective here as well, you know. Um, and I want to also, emphasize Chris a point on how much structure are we putting um, I think was the two uh, introductory talks were very helpful uh, but I do worry that if we use uh, bonds uh, bond and Lang's uh, framework for example we are already assuming that we have a grouped data problem um, because they're assuming that uh, the attribute is um, I mean a quantity you know so we have we can distinguish between uh, infinitely small differences within the attribute. But if we construct the attribute as something uh, more as, a, as in the cardinal numbers, you know, there's a one, there's a two, there's a three, but there's not really a thing such as like 2.79, you know, then we are not necessarily having a group data problem. Um, we still have the cardinality problem, but it's not the same as the one that, uh, that Bond and Lang are analyzing. So you might disagree or not with that, but I guess the, pro the, the, the important issue is, is to be uh, very conscious on how much structure we are already imposing in the, um, in the attribute and in the respondents for analyzing the problem. Uh, uh, perhaps it's just a working hypothesis how much structure we are imposing, it's just an assumption, uh, but we need to be very open then to reassess you know, the, the merits of that working hypothesis along the way, I think. Thank you very much, Christian. I think Mark made a sign. 
Um, yeah, just because the, the hands are slowly going down, so I thought I'd make a few quick responses to some of the, the comments that were made already, um, which has all been really good. So, yeah, I think it's really great that already the normative issues have come out um, quite strongly. So uh, I think a lot of the um, impetus for this debate um, has been the, the shift um, of a lot of the subjective well-being discussion into the public policy domain. Um, and I think it's uh, unsurprising that economists have kind of circled the wagons around the, uh, what I think many of them perceive as their territory. Um, and part of the reason why we're kind of having this um, discussion is, is to sort of help uh, get more people kind of onto the same page about what, uh, what defines different disciplines territory and why they might guard it and what um, expectations they have of different concepts. Um, I, I'm certainly uh, interested in, in this in part because of the notion that we could replace GDP with, um, with life satisfaction measures. Um, and one concern that I have with that is, is the ceiling effects problem that you can't measure social progress if people rescale every time they hit the top of their scale. Um, yeah, so I think that I find that to be um, quite important. I'm glad we've already um, discuss that. And then, yeah, on Chris's point about falsification, I think it's really important. Um, and I do get concerned sometimes that we are overstructuring um, or imposing too much structure, sorry. And I think this speaks to Tyler's point as well about, um, you know, people answer these questions very fast. And it's possible that they just kind of, uh, kind of like when you opinion poll someone, they just sort of have a quick visceral response to the question quickly um, turn that into a numerical response and give it to you. And it's not loaded with as much kind of information and cognition as we're applying to it. Um, I think basically my, my response to that is like, well, we need to start doing some research where we try to impose structure and see if it works. And then if it doesn't, we impose less structure. And, and my concern is that outside of the response shift literature and a few other um, bodies of work, there hasn't been much um, done on that front. Um, so in the last session, which is where Chris is presenting actually, so after your presentation, Chris, we have the kind of research proposals and there we'll see whether, I'd be very interested to hear your feedback on whether you think the, the questions that we intend to ask do falsify any of the hypotheses that are put forward in, in the workshop. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Mark. Uh, I saw that Casper uh, has his head up. Uh, yeah, I, I'm not sure uh, how much time we have now, uh, but yeah, maybe just also to, two remarks to to respond to what's been said. And I think while it's a good idea to to keep in mind that that ultimately it's it's a normative issue here, that the measurement problem should be kept, in my view, a scientific one that 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 isn't concerned with the normative status of these responses. But first that we figure out, okay, do, do responses refer to some mental state? And then we can later on pass on the problem to the philosophers to figure out whether, whether those mental states are what matters. But at the same time, while really trying to keep this just a scientific problem and not a, a normative problem, we, I mean, we should all keep in mind that ultimately we, we can't hit bottom reality here. And, and no matter what we do, will always be the case that mental states are hidden from view, uh, unlike say temperature that is, that is directly measurable. And, and we should just keep in mind that no matter what, what will be presented in, in the next couple of hours and days, direct access won't be possible. And so, so we should figure out what's second best. Thank you very much, Casper. We, we still have time for one or two interventions. Well, I saw that Magdalena Sofia wrote mm -hmm. something on the chat. I don't know if she wants to expand on it. Um, yes, um, not, not, not really a need to expand, but I think um, um, I was um, uh, thinking about the first point um, made about um, this being a, a, a problem about uh, different uh, values and tastes and, and normative approaches to to life as a whole. So um, I think that's another point. I mean, probably doesn't it add it adds more complexity, but 
that's a good reason to um, when you have the time and the resources uh, to ask about life satisfaction as a whole and use other more global well-being measures, um, subjective well-being measures, along with more domain-specific measures, whether you that give you a, a better um, idea of how much um, value or weight is put into one aspect or another. So whether uh, people consider that wealth is it's what affecting uh, their life satisfaction or whether uh, their different emotions or I don't know their relationships or the their their uh, their environment etc. So um, uh, when you have the time as a as a researcher. I think it's a it's a, a good approach to add this more domain specific measures of um, subjective well being. Thank you, Magdalena. I think there is some conversation going on in the chat. I don't know if people want to intervene. I see hands up. I think Car Carolyn's point is a very good one. Uh, um, uh, so is Marks, but 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 Carolyn's on on introducing everybody to everybody might might be well worthwhile because I I don't know everyone either. Yeah, and we have a good amount of time for that left. I think about three minutes, so maybe we should do that, and we can take the other discussion further in the next session. Uh, Alberto, could you roll call so down yeah. your screen? So yes, can uh, I? Because not everyone is seeing people in the same uh, in the same order, so I just called people down. So I started with me. Uh, I'm Roberto Prati. I'm a research fellow at the Wellbeing Research Centre at Oxford. Mark. Hi, uh, Mark. Can I ask if you could just also give your kind of background? Are you an economist? Are you a psychologist? You're right. So. Yeah, so I, uh, I studied philosophy and econometrics, and right now I consider myself as an economist, and I got my PhD in economics last year. Thank you. Welcome, Mark. Um, Mark Fabian at the Bennett Institute for Public Policy in Cambridge. Um, I did my PhD in economics, but I'm a terrible economist. Um, I do interdisciplinary research on well-being, and I think I come mostly out of um, Continental philosophy and a uh, bunch of psychology research in, say, self determination theory and this kind of stuff. Caroline Schwartz. Uh, I'm a behavioral scientist. My background is in uh, psych clinical psychology and public health, and I do research in quality of life uh, methods and theory uh, in medically ill populations. I'm based in uh, Concord, Massachusetts, uh, out of a nonprofit foundation, Delta Quest Foundation, and I'm affiliated with Tufts University School of Medicine and Mass General Hospital. Aspen? Um, yeah, I'm, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, I am uh, also a research fellow at the Oxford Wellbeing Research Center. And um, so by training, I did a DPhil in social policy. I, I would identify as a sociologist. But I mean, that's open to, to debate. Okay. Claudia. Uh, hi, I'm a um, professor at the Sorbonne and Paris School of Economics. So I'm an economist. I work on happiness. Michael Plant. I'm a postdoctoral research fellow at uh, the Oxford Wellbeing Research Center. I'm also the director of the Happy Lives, uh, a not for profit which tries to work out. How to, give people, how to give away your money to make other people happier. And I'm a philosopher by training, pretty poor social scientist. Well, sure. Tyler? Um, I'm a statistician and epidemiologist on faculty at the uh, Harvard School of Public Health and also the uh, director of the Human Flourishing Program at uh, Harvard. Um, most of my work is in either statistical methodology or um, well-being research, some background in philosophy and theology as well. Alois Twitter. Sorry for the pronunciation, by the way, for everyone. <laughs> no, that's OK. So my name is Alois Stutzer, and I'm a professor of political economics at the University of Basel. 
But I started my PhD doing research on well-being in economics. And so this is half of my research and the other half is traditional research in political economics. Respiring to late. Hello, I'm a prof at McGill University in Canada. And um, yeah, about a third or half of my research is on well-being and my background in economics. Christian Larule Filippi. Hi, I'm an economist, I think, by training, I would say, but now I'm uh, doing my PhD in philosophy of science. And Cambridge. where are you? At Cambridge, uh, UK. Eileen. Mm -hmm. Hi, yeah, so I'm also, I'm affiliated with the Austrian Wellbeing Research Center. Um, and I'm also an economist by training, and half of my research is in subjective well-being measures. Grisha Perino. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm a professor of economics uh, at University of Hamburg, and most of the time I do environmental economics and in particular climate change policy. Um, and now I'm venturing kind of slightly outside of my turf and uh, also do a bit of subjective well-being. Jakina. Hi, I'm uh, Jakina Dudem Guzman. I'm an assistant professor of economics at Amherst College, uh, also in Massachusetts, and I identify as a behavioral economist, and I do some work with subjective well-being. Magdalena Sofia. Um, hi, so I'm an analyst at the World Work Center for Wellbeing, uh, based in London. Uh, so now. Uh, working remotely from Chile, South America, um, and uh, sociology for background. I did my PhD on, on job quality and well-being in the workplace in, in Cambridge University. Katja Parina. Hi, everyone. My name is Katja. I'm a postdoc at the Center for Economic Performance at the London School of Economics, and I'm an economist by training. Marc Florbe. Yes, uh, so I'm, I'm an economist, um, a colleague of Claudia at Paris School of Economics now, and um, I've, I've been working mostly on welfare economics and public economics. Miriam Sprangers. Hi, uh, I'm a professor in medical psychology, so psychologist by training, based in uh, Amsterdam, Amsterdam University Medical Centers, and I coordinate a, a research line on quality of life in medically ill patients. Hi, I'm an economist too uh, at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem and Cornell University. And um, I uh, do a lot of uh, work on uh, happiness measurement in economics and also on survey methodology uh, and other things that are less related. Rito Odermatt. Hi everyone, I'm a research fellow at the University of Basel and also affiliated with the Center for Research in Economics and Wellbeing that is directed by Alois. Um, I would consider myself a broad behavioral economist. I'm an economist by training. Uh, yeah. Veronique Sebia. Hi, I'm a professor in biostatistics in the University of Nantes in France, with a special interest in psychometrics and patient reported outcomes and also measurement invariance. Uh, I think there is only one person who didn't introduce herself. I can't see the name, ESMV. Uh, Elena. Hi, um, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, I was worried that my microphone might be broken. Yeah, so my name is Elina Vesson, and for some reason I can't uh, change my uh, name here on the on the profile. But I'm a philosopher of science. I did my PhD uh, at the University of Cambridge, studying the, the um, what it takes to quantitatively represent various psychological attributes, uh, happiness being one of them. 
and currently I'm actually on a break, bit of a break from doing research and um, studying maths instead, but I like to try to keep up to date about what's going on in the field of measurement in social sciences. So that's why it's good to be here. <laughs>